Amen, and thank you, Pastor Steve, and those who led us in worship. Merry Christmas. It's, it is great to be with you here this Christmas Eve morning. For those of you who don't know, if you're visiting for the first time, my name is Josh Greiner, and I will be transitioning to the lead pastor. You heard Pastor Abernathy mention a little bit about that in January 7. So it's good to be with you, especially if this is your first time. And I hope that you caught in the announcements what's happening here tonight, again, as we have a a special Christmas Eve service. Let's all say it together, what time, just in case we missed it, what time are you supposed to be back here tonight? You're, You're at... Six o'clock, good. And if you said five, we look forward to seeing you then as well. (laughs) We're going to be continuing our series in Matthew chapter 2, but as you're making your way there, would you agree with me that one of the most challenging things that human beings often have as our life is we're trying to see what it is that God is up to in our lives and around the world? No matter where we look, this problem persists of we're trying to discern what is God up to. Take, for example, the life of Joseph. If you you were living back then, you you were one of his brothers or just watching, and, and you observed what happened. This young man being thrown into a pit by his brothers, eventually sold into slavery. If you could hop into the dungeon with Joseph for a moment and ask him, what do you think God is up to right now? I don't know that he would have a good answer for you. But at the end of his life, Joseph would be able to say this, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The point was, he didn't know in the moment what God was up to, but, but eventually, through the course of time, it became really clear what God was up to. He was saving his family. Or, for example, you could take a look at the, the story of Moses, one that we're going to examine in our story as well this morning. As Pharaoh orders the, the destruction of all the young Jewish-born males... He tells the, the women this, that when you see a, a midwife, when you see the Hebrew women, you see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. I got to believe at that moment in time, the, the Jews were confused. Why is God allowing this to happen? And no one would have foreseen in those moments that by, by doing this, that this would ultimately bring about Moses, him being born into the house of Pharaoh, And all of these events being used to take the people of Israel out of bondage. A Pharaoh was doing this. He was slaughtering these infants, of course, because he was afraid. We learned this earlier in chapter 1. He was worried because the more that they oppressed them, the more that they seemed to grow. The Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So the point that I'm trying to make here by way of introduction to our passage this morning is that would you agree with me that that when things are challenging, when things are hard, when things are difficult, one of the hardest things that we have to do is to understand and to see what is God up to. We saw that in the story of Moses. They were so worried that they did all of these sort of things to, to protect their own kingdom, but we're trying to figure out Well, what is it that God is calling for us to do? This morning we continue our series on unwrapping the Christmas gift. What we've been doing is looking at the the fulfillment passages of Matthew 1 and 2. As Matthew opens and starts his gospel, he says that the birth and the, the advent of Christ fulfills certain scriptures. And what we're trying to do is to read and to understand those scriptures here this morning. So this morning, we're going to continue in that series of Matthew chapter 2. And what I hope that we'll see here this morning, as has been mentioned already, is that we have a powerful comforter and that we'll see three actions that we can take in the midst of evil. I'm going to begin in chapter 2, verse 1, and read all the way to verse 18, just to make sure that we have the context of what's happening in our particular passage of verses 16 through 18. Follow along with me as I read. This is the word of the Lord. 
Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, O you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I might come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he'd seen that he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all of the region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. Again, we're looking this morning at Christ being our powerful comforter and what are actions that we can take here at Christmas time. In the midst of great evil. Before we do that, as we've been doing in our series, we we have to get the immediate understanding context of the passage that is being cited in order to make sure that we know what's going on, and that is in Jeremiah 31. We're not going to take time to read that great and marvelous passage. If you even remember, there are other great prophecies that are fulfilled even later in Christ's ministry and his resurrection. But the immediate context of what's happening in that passage, as we've talked about before in so many of these, is Israel has been carted off in exile because of their false worship of different gods. Craig Blomberg in his commentary on Matthew helps us understand the immediate context. Rama, the town that was mentioned in our passage here, was six miles north of Jerusalem. Departing captives from Judah's capital had to go through it. So those who were carried away had to go through Ramah to the road to the lands of the northern invaders. Ramah was thus the same distance north of Jerusalem as Bethlehem was south along the same road. Why was Rachel mentioned? She was uniquely qualified to be personified in this fashion. Why? Because she died, we're told in Genesis 35, on the way to the promised land. So Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Her last words expressed her sorrow and as her soul was departing, for she was dying. Death and childbirth proved to the extent of her motherly love as the mother of Israel. She does not forget her children. So our passage here in Matthew references back to Jeremiah 31, which itself is referencing back even further to the book of Genesis, highlighting what is being employed here. We've talked about before typology. Rachel is not literally mourning in the sense in Matthew 2, but, but is being used typologically. It's a bit like if you go back to those old World War II posters for a moment and you saw a picture of Uncle Sam pointing his finger. 
You knew exactly, without reading the words, we could put one up here today, you know exactly what's happening when you see Uncle Sam pointing his finger. He wants you to sign up for the military, and that's what's happening here in our text. Everybody understands the the metaphor, the the picture of Rachel being mentioned because of the the great exile and the, the slaughter. Why is this then a fulfillment? He goes on to say, there may well be a new Moses typology in in the baby Jesus. That's what's happening here. Being like Moses, being preserved from the threat of death, ordered by a wicked ruler. Are Are you seeing the overlap? From the baby boys around him. And this, of course, reminds us of the the nature of God's sovereignty and providence. God is not beyond permitting terrible evil in this world even to comparably innocent people. This occurs throughout both Testaments as an explicit legacy of the fall. Again, in Matthew's perspective, Jesus is understood as summarizing the the whole experience of Israel as well as bringing it to fulfillment. So that's what's happening in our passage in Genesis 31 as, as Matthew writes and alludes to and points back to this passage. Hopefully you can see why Rama, why Rachel, why why weeping. It's it's pulling in this exile picture, and it's pulling in the hope of the promised Redeemer. Again, this morning we're thinking about our powerful comforter, and the first action that we can take is then to, as was mentioned, embrace God's providence as it involves suffering. I'll put myself in this category. Can we all agree that that when God brings and allows suffering in our lives, one of the many responses that we have is, is we're just often confused. Why would God allow this to happen to me? Why would God allow suffering and hardship in my life? And what I think our text is pointing us to this morning is that our first step before answering that question, is is to embrace God's providence. What do I mean by God's providence? I mean God's all-powerful plan as He is working out His good will. Paul would put it this way in Ephesians chapter 1, that God is working all things, all things in our lives to the counsel of His will. My hope and prayer for all of us this morning is that you would develop at this Christmas time, if there is pain, if there is suffering in your life, that you would embrace God's providence if it involves suffering in your life. Blomberg, as he continues to comment on this passage, reminds us true believers, moreover, often follow their Lord in suffering and persecution. Matthew reminds us that this is part of God's sovereign plan. But just as the the larger context of Jeremiah 31, and we just don't have time to study it this morning, that might be something great for you to do after church this morning as you're thinking about your Christmas Eve reading, Jeremiah 31. It focuses exclusively on the vindication and the restoration of God's people, culminating in the establishment of His new covenant with them. So also suffering, rejection, and even death are never God's final word for either his Christ or his disciples, but they often must precede exaltation. Dear brothers and sisters, the call from our text starts here this morning with embracing God's providence in our lives and around the world. Embracing God's plan for suffering here suffering around the world for his glory and our good. David would put it this way when he talks about the the afflictions of the righteous. He says this, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Do, Do you like God's promises in his word? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's a promise you can take to the bank this Christmas Eve. But the message that that Jeremiah 31 brings and the the message that will continue is that is not the final word. If, If suffering is present in your life, 
Because many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. We're to see from our text here this morning that God's plan in your life, and I don't know what's going on. This Christmas season may have incredible pain or suffering, or incredible pain and suffering may be on the near horizon, but that is part of God's good plan and providence. In fact, we even see it from some of the greatest characters in the New Testament, Paul's Paul, the apostle of Christ, puts it this way when recounting his great suffering. Far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. And that's not talking about the Michigan stoned. Three times, I was waiting for the joke there, come on guys. Three times I was shipwrecked at night and a day, and I was drift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers from the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea. See, Paul would tell us even this Christmas morning to embrace, this Christmas Eve morning, to, to embrace God's plan even when suffering abounds. In his upper room discourse, Jesus would remind us, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So then let me ask you here this morning, as suffering may enter your life right now, as, it's, as you're experiencing it at Christmas Eve, or, or maybe coming quickly in your life, how well do you do at suffering? How well do you handle injustice in your life? We saw from our text, and we'll get there more in a moment, there there was a great injustice. How well do you do, Christian brother or sister, when, when, when life is unfair, when it appears that evil is all around, how well do you embrace the providence of the Lord? Is there evidence when people look at your life that you're handling this suffering well? It might be time at this Christmas season as you consider areas of growth that you would study the Scripture and and cling to those precious promises of God so that it's very clear when suffering is in your life, whether it's here or in the future, that you're trusting, that you're embracing the providence of the Lord. The second thing I think that we can see from our text is this, that we're called to rely on God's promises that he is going to make everything right. Or we'll talk more about what that means completely here in a moment. But Jeremiah 31 puts it this way, thus says the Lord, this is right after our passage that was being cited as a fulfillment, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears For there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. And your children shall come back to their own country. As we've mentioned in previous sermons, right, we've mentioned here already, the people have been carried off because of their idolatrous worship of pagan gods. Over and over, God promised this would happen, and and finally it did, and it served ultimately as a great wake-up call for the people of Israel. Because after the exodus, or after the, the people of Israel were carted off, they never returned to the false worship of pagan idols again. Of course, what's sad in Jesus' day is that they're not turning to the worship of false gods. They're worshiping their own man-made idols. But what we see is that this worked. This bringing the people out of the land and bringing them back, it actually worked to purify the people's heart. And so God promises 
to his people that he is going to restore. He is going to make things right. But that making things right is not on their time and is sure, certainly not on our time. Often God's justice, often God's plan takes time. We all struggle with God's patience when it's not towards us. I think we all agree that that when God is being patient with us in our own view, we're, we're very thankful for that. When God is patient with us, when we're wandering away from Him, we're so glad of the Lord's patience. But when it's not going on our time and in our way, then we struggle. We struggle to believe, we struggle to see what is God up to. And I think what our text is showing us here this morning is that we can trust, we can rely in the, in the moments of hardship and difficulty that, that one day God is going to make everything right in our lives. But that, that making everything right, that, that, that does not necessarily mean that He will restore our fortunes, bring about our health, allow relationships to be mended, what it means, I believe, is that eventually it will become crystal clear to us and to others what it is that God is trying to do. It doesn't mean the removal of suffering. It means that eventually we will see with clarity what God has promised. And what God has promised is that He's working everything for the exaltation of His name and everything for our good in making us like Christ. And so this Christmas season, this Christmas Eve, if there is suffering in your life or in the future, the text is calling for us not only to embrace God's providence, but to rely on His promise that one day He is going to make everything right, and that one day might even be in the future when He ultimately returns. Now it is at this point, too, we should also mention about the slaughter of these children and what that looked like in terms of its immediate impact and possibly even something for our lives now, given the small size of Bethlehem, Blomberg writes, and the rural nature of the surrounding region, there may have been as few as 20 children involved, and the, and the killing would have been represented as a relatively minor incident in Herod's career. Relatively minor, because as we heard last week from Pastor Bill, he was such a wicked and paranoid king that, that the slaughter of 20 children barely makes the history books in his account. But if you just go back there for a moment and consider these young families who who suffered great loss, there was no opportunity for them to appeal to the government. Uh, Meaning for today, if that happened here, the governor of Michigan had 20 young children put down, there would be an answer. There would be a, a way that we could seek justice. And yet for these families... Back then, there there was no opportunity for them to seek justice, for remedy of their souls. They had to instead, in those moments, rely on the Lord to bring about justice in their lives. And so, brothers and sisters, as you suffer and you think of ways to suffer well, don't take vengeance. Rather, trust in the Lord in all that you do, in all that you say this Christmas season, believing that God will make everything right. But I also want to say a word to those here. I've been talking mainly to to those who are in Christ. And the exhortation here is to rely on the Lord that, that everything will be made right. But to those who are here who don't yet know Christ, who would not have a personal saving relationship with the Lord, this all seems a bit strange. To embrace the providence of the Lord, to to rely on Him to make all things right, because you haven't ultimately dealt with your sin. You haven't ultimately been made right with Christ. 
You don't ultimately have the hope of knowing that you will be going to heaven. And I believe at this Christmas time, you can know that you're going to heaven. You, you can know you're going to heaven as well as you know your first name. You can be certain of it this Christmas season. And part of the reason that God may be allowing suffering in your life right here and right now might be to draw you to him. He might be using the incredible pressures that you have in your life to bring you to salvation. And so if you don't yet know Christ, as you hear these exhortations to to rely on the great comforter, to to embrace his providence, if you don't yet yet know Christ, I know that myself, the other pastors, so many of the people who are here in this room, even the person who brought you, we would be more than delighted to share the good news of Jesus Christ this Christmas season and how you can know that you were saved from your sin. Lastly, from this text, I think we can see the call to remember Christ's superior suffering. The slaughter of these children by Herod, a wicked king, in preserving his own line, was all about what was really good for him. We even see that sort of thinking, that sort of ethos here today in America with the the pro-choice movement. It's in the same vein of Herod, right? Your life can be destroyed for the preservation of mine. It's antithetical to the Christian gospel that says, your life before mine. Christ lays it down. But as we we look at the suffering that happened in this town, as we look at the, the suffering in our lives, at this Christmas season, I think one of the most important things that we can do is to look to and to remember the the superiority of the sufferings of Christ and, and ultimately what those sufferings accomplished for you and for me and the way in which that we would ultimately be saved. Christ, as he was on his way to the cross, would tell his disciples this of his suffering, that his soul is very sorrowful even to the point of of death. Christ, the spotless, sinless Son of God, who who fashioned the whole world and spoke it into being and and holds it in the power of His hand, this was going to be the height of injustice and evil. That He would be slaughtered. That He would be killed for sinful people. But it's what he came into this world for. It's it's what he was born to do here. And our call at Christmas time is to remember his superior suffering. That's not to minimize our own suffering. It's not to minimize the own injustice. But, But the text is really clear that even in our own suffering and resistance to temptation, we have not yet resisted to the point of shedding our own blood, highlighting the intensity of Christ's suffering. And so, dearly beloved, here today as we gather, let us remember at Christmas time ultimately the superiority of Christ and His suffering and what He went through as we examine how Christ fulfilled His birth, fulfilled this prophecy of His coming. And as we look to Christ, Let us see, as the author of Hebrews reminds us, that we have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Here this Christmas time, you have a sympathetic high priest, one who has in every respect been as tempted and tried as we are, yet he is without sin. And therefore, let us draw near with confidence to that that throne of grace so we might find mercy and grace in our time of need. This Christmas season, as we respond to evil and injustice, as as we consider the Christmas story, Christ's suffering is ultimately what this was all about, so that our relationship with Him could be restored. 
And then finally, we saw it in our text in Jeremiah 31, and we see it in Philippians chapter 2, that, that when God has been making all things right, ultimately there is exaltation. Philippians 2, 8 through 10 puts it this way, And being found in the form of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the, the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Let us see this Christmas season, as we, as we look in our lives, let us see the superiority of Christ's suffering so that we could come to Him. Let us embrace His providence even when life is hard and life is difficult. And let us cling to, rely, and trust that He will ultimately make things right in our life and in this world, whether it's in this life or in the next. You join me in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and, and we confess that as we study your word, we see um, how clear you are working, but yet often in our own lives, we doubt to see how you are working. So Father, we come before you this Christmas Eve as we consider this passage and we pray that we would be a people that embrace your sovereign and good plan. That we would be a people who believe by faith that, that you will allow and you will be working all of these things for our good and for your glory. And that you've called us on this Christmas Eve, this Christmas season, to remember ultimately what this was all about. Your son's sacrifice on the cross. I pray that for those of us who know Christ as our Savior, that, that this Christmas season would be sweet as we remember the advent of your Son to earth that secured our salvation. And I pray that for anyone here, or as Pastor Bill mentioned, our sister churches in this community and around this world, that, that if people are hearing the gospel for the very first time, that they can repent and believe and that their sin can be cleansed and that salvation can be secured for them in heaven, that I pray that even today at this service that persons would come to know you. Father, we thank you for sending your son that ultimately we could have peace with you. And I pray that as we celebrate with family and I pray that as we celebrate with friends that it would bring you glory. We ask this in your son's name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.